into the book of John. Y'all excited about this book? I am. It's a good book. So, this is John 1, part 1. Because it can take more than one week to get through this book. Or this chapter. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Jim. Focus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So John begins this gospel by speaking about the word, the word, but he doesn't really, right off the front, he doesn't explain at first who or what the word is. So I wanted to, you know, just kind of question pops up. So what is a word? A word. It's part of a sentence, right? A word is a unit of speech that allows us to express ourselves to others. We didn't have words, we wouldn't have sentences, we wouldn't have communication, right? But John is not writing about speech, but rather about a person. And that person is, of course, spoiler alert, is Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he is God. So through Jesus, God has fully expressed himself to mankind. He is the word. Fully, you know, it's... <laughs> but by coming into the world, Christ has perfectly revealed to us what God is like. By dying for us on the cross, he has told us how much God loves us, right? God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die for us. So that means Christ is God's living word, to man, the expression of God's thoughts. The Greek word that John uses here for the word is logos. Have you ever heard that word before? <laughs> we actually have logos software, Bible, Bible study, so it's logos. The Greeks had developed a philosophy that was built upon the assumption that the logos, the word, was the foundation of everything on earth. Huh. Think about that for a minute. The earth was simply a shadow of the reality of the logos that existed somewhere in the heavens. Right? So the word had a foundation. Well, So the Jews, believing in God, took the Greek concept of logos one step further. Plato said, behind everything, there's a perfect thought. That's what they called logo, was the perfect thought that was behind everything, all of creation anyway. The Jews said that behind the thought, there must be a thinker. So, you know, if you look around the world, we do not see perfection, which is what they say logos is perfection the perfect thought or the perfect word. And we don't see perfection here on earth, but they said, well, it must exist somewhere. That's some deep philosophy there, right? It doesn't exist here, but it has to be somewhere. Yes, and if there is a true perfect thought, logos, there must be a true perfect thinker, right? Right? That makes sense. I like where they're going with this. So John takes it to the next level here. In the beginning was Logos, the word, God. Not just a philosophy, but a personality. In the beginning was the Logos, the perfect, the perfection, the word, and the thinker. In the beginning was the word. He did not have a beginning himself because he's God. A lot of people say, well, Jesus was created at the beginning, but it's not true. He was there with him in the beginning. But he existed from all eternity. He never was created. He had no beginning. The word was with God, not created by God because the word is God. He had a separate and distinct personality, Father, Son, Spirit, right? 
He was not just an idea, a thought, or some vague kind of example, but a real person who lived with God. The word was God. He not only dwelt with God, but he himself is God. Big G, together, Father and Son. Holy Spirit's there too, but right now we're just doing this. The Bible teaches that there is one God and that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three of these persons are God. In this verse, two of the persons of Godhead are mentioned, the Father and the Son. So, I know we can't, as humans, understand that. But, and, and this is one of the first and of many very clear statements in this gospel that Jesus Christ is God. So by the time we're done with John, you will also believe that, there are, that Jesus is God. That's the point. So many people think not. He's just a good teacher, you know. He's a good man. No, God. You know, it's not enough to say that he is a God, little g, that he is God-like. He's a good person, good teacher, whatever, you know, people say about him. Or that even that he is divine. He is. But the Bible teaches that he is God, big G, period. And if you don't believe in him, you need to rethink what you believe. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. <laughs> I love that. It just kind of makes it totally clear, right? All things were made through him. He himself was not a created being. Rather, he was the creator of things. The Father made everything through Jesus. The reason for creation is Jesus. The reason we're here today is Jesus. So this includes mankind. We were created through and for and by Christ. The Father, the thinker, Jesus, the word, the logos, the perfect thought. You know, mankind was created, animals, the stars in the heavens, even the angels are created being. All things visible and invisible that were created were created through and by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. <laughs> I love the, the kind of a weird wording, but it's like, you know, there can be no possible exception. Everything that exists that was made, made by God. So if a thing was made, he made it. As creator, he is, of course, superior to anything he has created. So he is God, we are not. We are the creation. And if you can't accept that, well, you're going to have difficulty later in life. All three persons of the Godhead were involved in the work of creation. You remember that? Back in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Genesis 1, 2. <laughs> All things were created through him, talking about Christ, and for him, talking about Christ. And that's in Colossians 1. So... Then John builds onto this whole thing even more in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was life. <laughs> this does not simply mean that he possessed life, but that he was and is the source of life. He picked up man and breathed into him, and life came, right? 
Every breath you take is a gift from God. So the word here includes both physical and spiritual life. That's a lot of life, I think. (laughs) So when we were born, you came out of your mama, we received physical life, the flesh, the water. When we were born again as Christians, that's when you received spiritual life. I hope you all have been born again. I'm pretty sure this congregation has. But anybody watching this in the future, get saved. It's awesome. But both physical and spiritual life come from God. So the life was the light of men. The same one who supplied us with life is also the light. What does the light do for you? Think about that this week, yeah. He provides the guidance and direction necessary for us to live life. I would be in a completely different place now if God didn't guide me along the way. It is one thing to exist, but quite another thing to know how to live. I know so many people that just exist, go through life without purpose. They just go through the grind and they're just miserable. They're just existing. But quite another thing to know how to live, which why I get excited about the Bible, because I want to know how to live and I want to know how to live better. I want to grow and learn. I've met too many people who just, they're happy being stuck in their little whole. They go to work, they come home, they watch the same shows, they do the same things, they eat the same foods, and then they do it all over again every day. And it's just, just existing. There's more to life. Where they go to the bar and get drunk to ease the pain of the hole that they fell in. Know how to live, to know the true purpose of life and to know the way to heaven. That's an important one, too. So the same one who gives us life is the one who provides us with light to know how to live that life for the path that we're on. Everybody's on a different path. I mean, it's kind of the same road, but, you know, we, everybody has different gifts and different purposes. And God has a plan for each one of you, and your plan is different than my plan. But God lights that up for you if you let him. Verse 5, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the Greek word translated comprehend can mean two different things. It can mean extinguish, or it can mean understand. Both meanings are applicable in this verse. For the darkness could neither understand nor extinguish Jesus. Jesus being the light came into the dark world. And the world didn't know what to do with him. Woo, it's confusing, right? I expected this from you. No, I expected this from him. You know, they all had preconceived notions. And he came and did his thing. But they couldn't extinguish him. Even they put him on the cross and tried to kill him. Well, they did kill him. Buried him. But three days later, what happened? He came back, resurrection, right, exciting. The light shines into the dark. You know, when sin entered the world, it brought darkness to the minds of men. We can see that clearly if you'll look at our politicians, right? (laughs) It plunged the whole universe, really, into darkness, spiritually speaking, a lot, yeah. Men neither knew God nor they want they didn't even want to know God. And it was into this darkness Jesus came. He is the light shining in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. You know, this may mean that the darkness did not understand the Lord Jesus when he came into the world. Men did not realize who he was really or why he had come. 
Some people reading the Bible kind of almost had it figured out, but other meaning is the darkness did not overcome it. Then the, the thought would be that men's rejection and enmity did not prevent the true light from shining, so they didn't extinguish the light. Darkness never overpowers light. You know, when you walk into a room, it's basically dark. You go into a dark room, and you what happens when you turn the light on? Flip the switch, the light comes on. What happens? The darkness goes away. The room is lit up. And you know what's amazing to me is it happens every time. If you turn the switch off, the light goes away, and the room is filled with dark again instantly. But you turn the light back on, it's poof. Darkness never, never wins. Darkness never overpowers light. That's just a fun concept, but it's, it has such power. It's the same thing spiritually. When you let Jesus in, you turn on the light in your life. You know, but it's the same thing. If you turn the light off, you kick Jesus out of your life, the darkness comes back in. It's hard to do things in the dark. You can't hardly read a book. You can't, you know, walking through the room is kind of dangerous. You say, okay, where's the bed? Oh, there it is. Oh. Anyway, but walking through life in the dark, in the being blind and not seeing and hearing and just being stuck in a pit. Invite Jesus in and you will have the light. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So here, John the Apostle, the uh, Apostle, <laughs> Apostle, <laughs> my tongue bounced there for a second, is introducing us to John the Baptist. So he's not talking about himself. He's talking about John the Baptist, who was sent from God as a forerunner of the Lord Jesus. His mission was to announce the coming of Christ and to tell the people to get ready to receive him, to receive the light the life, the word of God. So John the Baptist being a prophet, or as a prophet, John the Baptist spoke to people on behalf of God. So spreading the word and speaking to you on behalf of God. So verse 7, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So he's just more witness. Say, Jesus is coming. Get ready. This man came to testify the fact that Jesus was truly the light of the world so that all people might put their trust in Jesus. So we're not called to be attorneys. If you want to get legal about this. We are not called to debate, argue, and, or convince. We are called to be witnesses. So what does that mean? To share the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth concerning what the Lord is doing in your life. True witnessing is really just that, being a witness. You know, somebody might say, I, you got a new truck. You are so lucky. Sure, lucky, right? <laughs> but if you're a faithful witness, what do you say? You say, well, the Lord provides for me. I'm blessed. Luck had nothing to do with it. God's lighting the way of my path, and so I was able to do that. Or... Oh, I see your car got towed away. You must be angry. That's a bummer. But if you're really a faithful witness, you'll say something more like, I know God will work it out. He has a plan for me. Maybe he's got a better car for me. This one had to go away. Or I have to go get it now out of the 
compound yard or the tow yard and somebody I'm going to run into that I wouldn't have if it didn't get towed and I'm going to be able to witness to them and they're going to get saved and have eternal life. Who knows? God works out things. It's awesome. That's simple. How to be a witness for God. Do you give him credit for the good things that happen in your life? Do you give him credit for helping you out of the bad things that help him? I always say the good, everything good in my life comes from God. Everything bad in my life is my fault. But God takes my stupidity and changes it or works it out for the good of those who love him, right? And I do love him. And so he does take my stupidity and works it out somehow, and I get blessed by it. It's awesome how that works. You know, too often people think witnessing is confrontational and argumentative. I'm right, you're wrong, listen to me. If you don't get saved, you're going to hell. No, don't be like that. I used to be like that, and I push people away. Like we've been talking about, just say, come. Come see what we're about. Come look at how life can be better. It doesn't need to be like that. I have found great freedom in simply sharing with people what the Lord is doing with me, what he has shown me. It takes the pressure off. You don't have to go beat people over the head on the beach to feel like you're doing your evangelistic, you know, check that box. I beat somebody over the head with the Bible today. I, you know, instead I find great pleasure in simply sharing what the Lord has done for me in my life. How that impacts them is up to them, but you say God is good, and this is why I say that. Just look at who he gave me for a wife. She's good in my life. That's, you know, in case you didn't get that. <laughs> I love my wife, and I thank God for her regularly. Anyway, so what is God doing in your life? How has he changed you? I used to be a stupid head, and now I'm wiser. I'm not quite smart yet, but I'm getting there. By the grace of God, go I, right? And what is he going to continue doing in your life? What path are you on? How does it affect you? That's witnessing what is God doing? People are, gonna, the people are watching. When you have bad days, how do you get through it? Do you hang on God? Do you let the light and the life of the world live in you and flow out good days, bad days, and in-between days? You know, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, Second Peter 3. The desire of God's heart is that not one person should die without knowing him. God so loved the world, he sent his son for everybody, the whole world. So think about the person who bugs you and irritates you the most. Y'all got a person in mind? Yeah. You know that the Lord loves that person and wants them to get saved? That Jesus came and died for that person. I personally reject the altar Calvinistic teaching that says that God has already determined that some are born to be damned. There are people who teach that. The scripture says John was sent for a witness that all through him might believe. So John the Baptist expected everybody to believe. You know, the word all in Greek is an interesting one. Do you have any idea what it means? The word all. All people. It means all. Everyone. It's pretty simple. Verse 8. He was not that light. So John the Baptist was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. So if John had 
<clears throat> tried to attract attention to himself, he would have been unfaithful to his appointed task. So he pointed men to Jesus and not to himself. And that was his task, really, right? Jesus is coming, look. So in your witnessing, it's about what he is doing in you, so you point them to him. Because Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and he will light your path. He is the true light. He is the answer to all your problems. Simple, basic. It's not that complicated. Verse 9. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Every one of them. <clears throat> At the end of time, no one will be able to say that he didn't have an opportunity to know that there is a God. So all those people standing at the white throne judgment we talked about three chapters ago, you know, they're not going to have excuses. It's all written down in the books. All their choices, all their actions, all their works and deeds. And you go, well, look, it's in the book. The light has come, and it lights every man who comes into the world. Romans 1 tells us that creation around us is a testimony to God's reality and that our, con um, our consciences within us verifies his truth. I think every man really knows there's a God, every person on the planet. Psalms 19, Psalm 19 states that the heavens declare the glory of God and that there is no place on earth where their voice is not heard. You look up and see the stars. The heavens declare the, the majesty of God. So whether a man looks up to the sky or on the earth or all creation or within his own heart, the truth is written on our hearts. So he is left without excuse regarding the, uh, the existence of his creator. But how many people just ignore that, right? Every man knows that there is a God. They just choose to reject him. I firmly believe that if there is someone in the most remote corner of the earth, stranded on an island or just hanging out there by themselves, getting away from all of us other people. And they're hungering for the, to know God. God will find a way to get to them, to explain himself to them. God will do whatever it takes to reveal himself to them. You know, he may choose to, to send an angel and speak to them. Or do some sort of miracle in their, you know, on that little island. Or maybe he'll send you over there to be a witness. Say, hey, this is what Jesus is all about. This is how he's doing it for me. He can do it for you. Come. <laughs> Go tell them that Jesus died for them. You may be the very messenger the Lord uses to reach one who is waiting to hear the gospel. That person hiding in the back closet or the back office in, the, in your office building or wherever. <laughs> you know, like we talked about back in Revelation 22, we are to extend the invitation, come, just come. It's not too late. You're not too far like the song said today. Just come as you are. Doesn't matter where you are, you don't have to get cleaned up before you become a Christian. Come come be a Christian and God will help you clean up. 
Come be a part of the kingdom of God. Come be a part of the family. We do potlucks the first Sunday. Come and eat with us. (laughs) Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You know, Jesus came into the world, and all of creation acknowledged him. The winds obeyed him. The water supported him when he walked on it. The rocks are ready to cry out and praise him. But there was one segment of creation that did not receive him. Humans, man, (laughs) is the only part of all of creation that rejects God. You know, it's crazy to me to watch people who are sports fans. I mean, I used to be a Bronco fan when I lived in Denver, and that was mainly because I enjoyed going to Bronco parties because they were always potlucks, and it was fun, and we would do stuff, eat, and it was fellowship. And we watched the game. I'm not a big sports fan, you know, and I'm not trying to poke fun at, well, I am. Sports fans are crazy. (laughs) You know, they go to watch their favorite teams, right? And when their team scores, what do they do? They go crazy and they high five and jump around and dance and throw food and, you know, not everybody. Some people are a little more calm, but you, you ever gone to a football game? They're crazy. They lift their hands when, you know, victorious especially. (laughs) They clap exuberant. They dance around. They cheer wildly. They stand. They yell. They stomp. They paint their bodies and wear different colors, you know, right? Whatever your team is, you paint your body. And they don't care who sees them. You know, the kiss cam comes around and it's like, oh, there's, you know, the whole world is seeing you in your paint and celebrating and, you know, acting crazy. And the same thing happens at rock concerts, beauty pageants, maybe not as much there, and rodeos. I don't know. They're all too busy drinking beer to care. No, I'm just kidding. Humanity creatively and radically worships with abandon. Everything but God. When it comes to worshiping Jesus, what do we do? We sit down, we fold our arms, not supposed to laugh or smile in church because this is serious. You've got to be sober. You know, we speak in hushed tones. You know, our culture finds it very easy to worship sports, movies, rock stars, but has a great difficulty worshiping Jesus. Man still rejects the light today. Why can't we get excited about God? You know, I have put a, I have squashed the whole dancing in the aisle thing. Why is that? I want to dance in the aisles. I don't know if you watch me when I'm singing. I do a little jig. I would like to be running up and down the aisles and worshiping God with enthusiasm. But why don't we? Because when somebody that doesn't know God comes in the door and sees us all doing that, they're going to say, these people are crazy. But they can go to a football game and they, they these people are crazy, but I'm joining them. But you come to a church and they say, these people are crazy, I'm leaving. So we do bend to that. But I give you permission to dance in your seat, to lift your hands and praise your God, to get excited that our God is real, that he is the life, he is the light. We keep it contained a little just because, you know, We don't want to come across this crazy and weird. When I walk into churches and they're waving flags and dancing in the aisles, I'm thinking, okay, God, these people are crazy. 
is this where you want me? Well, that's what it was like when Nancy and I first joined this church. It was crazy. But God said, Jim, just wait. I have a plan. I want you here. I'm like, okay. <laughs> he did have a plan. They stopped waving flags and stopped dancing, and, you know, pretty soon I took over. It's crazy. I know I'm going down rabbit trails. We might not get done today, so with what I have planned. But we'll keep going. Anyway, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So now he offered himself to all mankind again, and to those who receive him, he gives the right and authority to become children of God. You have the right, the authority to become, yeah. So this verse tells us clearly how we can become children of God. It's not by good works, not by church membership, not by doing one's best, but by receiving him. By believing in his name, in the name of Jesus. It's the only way to heaven. Believe. You know, the name Jesus really means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is the name of our God. Jehovah is salvation. Do you believe that? You will receive power to become a son of God when you believe that Jesus is not merely a savior or even the savior, but you receive power to become the son of God when you believe that he is your savior. A lot of people say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, and that's as far as it goes. I believe he exists, but is he your savior? Has he changed your life? Did you let him in? Do you follow his word? Belief in him changes your actions. Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you cannot obtain salvation by being born into an awesome Christian family. Did you know that? It doesn't matter how many Bible teachers or preachers or mighty prayer warriors there are in your family. That does not save you. Your bloodline does not save you. According to this verse, none of that makes a bit of difference because birth into God's family is not passed on genetically. It has nothing to do with blood, which speaks of descent, nor does birth into God's family have anything to do with desire. Can you just desire it? I just want to be part of God's family. But if you desire it, why wouldn't you get it? So that, you know... You can't enter God's kingdom by sheer willpower or want. I want it. But if you want it, he will guide you into it. Paul tells us there is none that seeks after God, not one who really desire him. In Romans 3, there's nobody that really wants God or desires him. Nor... Does birth into God's family have anything to do with determination? I'm just determined to get there. Man can't will himself into the relationship with God. But it's so simple. And, you know, God does it all. And I know that sounds kind of Calvinistic, but it is his sovereign work in the hearts of men that draw them to him. I know that's some deep stuff. You might be saying, <laughs> didn't verse 9 say that his desire is that not one should perish? 
Why then doesn't he do his sovereign work in the hearts of every man and draw every man to himself? It's his work, it's his spirit that draw us. Why doesn't he do that for everybody? I don't know. He's God, I'm not. I don't know. But I do know we serve an enormous God. He has given every man the opportunity to choose him and yet has retained his right to choose whom he will. <laughs> How can these two principles be compatible? I'm not that smart. I don't know. I'm sorry. As your pastor, I should know things, but I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know that. I do know that according to Romans 8, 29, God for no, um, God's foreknowledge is a big factor in all of this. But then you have to ask, did God choose us because he knew we would choose him? Or did we choose God because he had already chosen us? Well, I don't know that either. I'm sorry. I don't mean to let you down. I haven't figured God out yet. I do know that if you think very long about this, your brain will explode. Sometimes mine is almost there. You could get really frustrated and beat your head against the wall. Or you can, like me, finally agree with J.B. Phillips who said, if God was small enough to figure out, he wouldn't be big enough to worship. Ponder that one throughout the week. If God was small enough to figure out, if you could understand our God, he wouldn't be big enough to be worth worshiping. But our God is bigger than we can figure out. And he is worth worshiping. And when you figure that out, you can fall on your face and worship him. Say, Lord, I don't know. I don't understand. And it's okay not to know everything. But I thank you for choosing me. Whether you chose me first or I chose you first, you knew what I was going to choose before you created me. You know, I believe that God is sovereign and he knows everything from the creation, from the beginning of creation. But I also believe that he gave us free will and our choices matter and him being sovereign knows what we're going to choose, but he accepts our choices. So whether he chose us first and that, or not, he knew what we were going to choose. I think we chose him first before we were created. He knew what we were going to choose. We just have to live through it. He's sovereign, but man still has responsibility. We have responsibility to be witnesses, to tell people what God is doing in our lives. And to tell ourselves what God is doing. Sometimes you have to witness to yourself. I have to remind myself why I don't, you know, go party with the party animals or go, you know, be super crazy in the world. It's not that I really want to even do those things anymore. I used to be a party animal. I used to go to bars and dance and drink and carry on. But, you know, I am much more pleased with my life now that I don't do those things. I am more satisfied. I have peace and joy, and I have, great, I have better quality friends, better quality family. You know, I think of the friends I used to have, and they were liars and stealers and cheaters and, you know, really people that just stab you in the back at the drop of a hand, at the drop of, of a pin, whatever. Anyway. As you go through this week, I recommend that you put some extra thought into how God has lit up your path. Think back over your life. 
How has he got you to where you are? What lights shined in your life to get you there, to light the path? What has he taught you? And how has he guided you with his light? And what does the life that he provides look like in your life? How has he brought you life in such a dark world with his light? And while you're at it, you might want to just thank him for those things. You know, are you thankful for the stuff you have, the meals that you eat, the time you have to spend with loved ones? Just think about that and thank God. It's always good to talk to him, you know, let him know. Wow, I made it through. 11.05, we did good. Let me say a prayer and then we'll... (laughs) Oh, Lord, we just praise you and thank you. We do thank you again for your word. We thank you for loving us, guiding us, directing us. We thank you for the light. We thank you for the life that you fill us with. And just thank you for all that you do. And as we go, just keep us safe. Keep us in your will. Direct us. Shine your lights in us and through us out into this dark world. Help us to be witnesses in loving, kind ways. And we just thank you again and again. You're awesome. And we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So...